Hi, this is Chaz Palmateri, Chaz Palmateri Podcast. I'd like to remind you all, if you like what you hear, please hit the subscribe button and be a member here. It doesn't cost anything. It's free. Come on. So uh, this episode's about one incident that happened in my life and about what people do for the money. In fact, the name of this movie that we wrote me and my buddy Tony, which I won't say his last name. I don't know why, but I just won't. It's called For the Money. I was home one day, and my agent called me up. And he says to me, Chaz, there's this guy who's uh, he's probably going to go to jail. He has 32 counts against him. I said, wow, 32 counts. What did he do? He goes, well, there's talk that he embezzled and also... Remember in the uh, early uh, 90s, late 80s, early 90s, there was that fraud with the stocks, you know, the boiler room things and stocks and all that stuff. Well, this guy got caught with it and he's doing, uh, he's going to go to jail. Uh, Supposedly, 32 counts against him. He was out on bail and he wanted me to write a movie about it. So I I told my manager, I said, I I, I don't know about that. I said, you know, uh, writing about stocks, uh, I don't know too much about it. He goes, no, no, he's going to, you could work with him. He wants to work with you. And I said, I really don't know. But he wants to pay you this amount of money. I said, what? He wants to pay that much? Out of his own pocket? He said, yes. I said, wow. I, I don't need to tell you what it is, but it was a lot. You know, in the high... Whatever. So I said, well, you know what? I don't know if I want to do this on my own. So I called my friend Tony, who's a wonderful writer, who we've we've written things together before, but mainly I write by myself, and he writes by himself. But once in a while, we write things together, and when we work together, it's great. So I said, Tony, why don't you come with me? Uh, He wants to meet with me, and we'll see. So... Tony says, well, how much? And I told him, he goes, wow, all right, well, thanks. You know, he appreciated it. And him and I go to Manhattan to meet this guy. I won't say his name because you'll look it up on Google and the whole thing will be there. So um, we meet with him and he says, oh, I love Bronx Tale, ba ba ba. You're the guy to write my story. It'll be real. It'll be this. It'll be that. And he was really funny because he used to go, you know why I love your writing, Chaz? I said, why is that? He goes, He goes like this to me. He goes, I said, what's that? He goes, it's dirty. It's dirty. The dirt. Your your words, I feel the dirt. He goes, a lot of writing is like a big souffle. He goes, it looks gorgeous, but you get a fork, you put a hole in it, it's got nothing. But yours, it's got dirt. So I said, wow, this guy was a hell of a salesman, this guy. So he tells me how much he's going to pay. I said, okay. He goes, but here's the thing. You got to come. So I introduced him. He said, you guys got to come to my mansion in uh, West Palm. Oh, excuse me, Palm Beach. And you got to live with me for five weeks, and I will tell you. I said, hey, come on. We can't. I, I, he goes, you, you, that's the only way I could do this. And says he's going to give us more money if we do it. This is what you do for the money. That's why the theme of this episode is things you will do for the money. I said, well, five weeks, I'm going to make all this money. Why not? So Tony and I talk it over. We say, we'll do it. Okay. We go down to Palm Beach. I want you to stay with me here because it gets interesting. We go down to Palm Beach. His driver picks us up. Uh, His driver. (laughs) Carmine was his name. I'll say Carmine. It wasn't his name, but I'll say Carmine. Picks us up. In a big Benz, we get in the car. We drive to his mansion in Palm Beach. Now, we're ready to stay here for five weeks, folks, right? We get out. We walk in. He says, uh, I got a text from the guy, the boss. And he says, uh, he's ready to work. As we're pulling up, he's telling us this. Yeah, he just texts me. He's ready to work. I said, oh, all right. He wants to work now. We just got it. I said, I don't care. Man's paying me, right? We do it. 
I walk in, I take out my yellow pad, I always begin writing notes on my yellow pad. I started that with Bronx Taylor, it's like a habit now with me. So uh, we get in the foyer when we first walk in, and he and, he, and this guy, Carmine, this big guy, goes, uh, all right, take off your clothes. I said, what? You gotta take off your clothes. I said, I mean, Tony, like, take off our clothes. Why do we got to take off our clothes? He said, well, the, my boss, we'll call him Bob, Bobby. He goes, Bobby's in the, uh, in the jacuzzi, and he wants to talk to you in the jacuzzi. I said, what do you mean he wants to talk to us in the jacuzzi? I don't want to go in a jacuzzi. I just want to write this movie. He'll only talk to you if you go in the jacuzzi. So I realized right away, he wants to see if we're wired. You know, I mean, you're going to, you don't even think you're going to not trust me. You're just hiring me. Now you think I'm wired? Because he knew the FBI was always still trying to find out things. So now we got to take all our clothes off. I just, my clothes are not even out of my bags yet. Tony and I get undressed. We're in our underwear. We walk over to the jacuzzi. And he's sitting there with his hands on the jacuzzi with a big bottle of champagne here, a bottle of Dom Pet, you know, smoking a big cigar. He goes, everything, everything. So we had to take off all our clothes, and we get in a jacuzzi. Now my hands are wet. I got the yellow pad of paper on the side, right? I'm trying to write. And we start talking. He's asked, telling me questions. about. I was framed. I want my children to really know what happened. What they did to me was wrong. And I'm saying to myself, this guy sounds like a saint. But, you know. And meanwhile, my buddy Tony's buying everything he's saying. But I'm not saying, well. So I said, buddy, Bobby. You got 32 counts against you. You had to do something. You did something wrong. No, it was all bullshit. All of a sudden, a helicopter goes by over us. Two minutes later, a helicopter comes back. Five minutes later, a helicopter goes back. I said, what the hell's going on with these helicopters? He goes, I oh, don't worry about it. It's the FBI. They keep looking for shit. And me and him are looking at each other. Holy <laughs> shit. What the hell is going on here, right? All of a sudden... I look out, he, he, he had a big house next to a golf course. We look out at the golf course, right? And we see guys, uh, like a, a Deucem playing golf, two guys, and they got binoculars and they're looking at us with binoculars. And I'm saying, holy shit, what the hell is going on here, right? So I knew right away, he goes, ah, they, don't worry, they're phonies. They keep, they, he goes, they're not golfers, they keep looking, trying to catch me in something. So I keep saying, Bobby, 32 counts, you got the FBI over your head, you got the faking that they're playing golf, you had to do something, Bobby. <laughs> Tell me the truth. And he just kept going, I did nothing, right? So now we, we get out of the jacuzzi after we're there a few hours, I felt like a prune, I'm all shriveled up, right? And we get dressed, we walk into the thing, and there's his girlfriend there. And he was, there was this girl, very sweet girl, beautiful girl, very nice, big tip, big boobs, all right, who uh, <laughs> Beautiful body, really a, a gorgeous girl. And, but she was a real neighborhood girl. And, and as she's sitting there, I got to remember not to call them by their names, right? And he says to her, baby, baby, could you get us some food? And she, and she looks, she goes, I'll give you food, but talk to me nice. <laughs> we're just, we're there two seconds and this is what's going on. Finally, we sit down. She's giving us some food, right? And he gets, can I have a Coke? Can I have a Coke? He was so high strung, this guy. She gives him a Coke, right? And, and he goes, what? What? What's this? I want ice. I want ice. She goes, you want ice? I'll give you ice. She fills up the thing on the refrigerator with ice, and she flings it across the room. And all the ice goes over our heads, and me and Tony are like this. Oh, oh, right? There's your ice. <laughs> now I'm saying to myself, we have five weeks of this. Five weeks. But... For the money, you stick it out. So we finish, we have something to eat, we come back out at night, he wants to work again. We start to write, and all of a sudden, he says, I need a break, I want to go lay down. He goes and lays down. So the big guy, his bodyguard, Carmine, comes over to me, right? And he goes, Chaz, I need to talk to you. I said, what's the matter? He goes, you seem like a very smart guy, and I need some advice. I go, what's that? All of a sudden, you hear this. his girlfriend lived there in the house. She's screaming on the top floor. She's holding a boot, a cowboy boot. And she goes, you're sick. You're sick. 
I told you I don't want to do this anymore. What the hell is wrong with you? You're sick. And she walks away. And I go, what the hell is that about? We just got here, folks. And he goes, well, Chaz, I really like to film us having sex. But uh, he goes, so she didn't like it. So what I did was I put a hole in the cowboy boot and I put the camera in the boot. And I put the boot facing the bed so we could film us. And she found the boot. He goes, was that wrong? So now I go, well, I, you know, I don't really know. I mean, I, I'm trying to be a shrink here with this guy, right? This guy's a stone cold killer. And he's telling me about this boot, right? So I'm freaking out. And finally, I just say, you know what, uh, Carmine, I really, I think you should stop filming each other, right? So he goes, so the next day we stop. The next day we go for a ride with Carmine. He wants us to show us around Palm Beach because uh, Bobby said to him, show them around, I got things to do, show them around. He drives us around Palm Beach and we're coming back and there's these two old people crossing the street on, on um, what do you call those things, you know, walkers. And he's driving towards me, he goes, oh yeah, we hate these two people, they're always calling the cops on us. He goes, watch this. And he turns the car and he drives towards them. And we're like this, oh, whoa, whoa, right? He goes, watch this, and he screeches, and they almost fall off the, and he starts laughing. So I say, oh my God, this has got to end. I can't do this. This is the first two days, folks. But the things you do for the money, right? For the money, you do it. So that night, after the second day, I say, I, I, I knock on Tony's door. It's like late, about one, two in the morning. I go in. I mean, it was a beautiful mansion. Yeah, we had our own bathrooms, bedrooms, gorgeous. I say, Tony, we need to talk. He goes, what? I go, come here. So we go into the bathroom, and we turn on the faucet really loud in the shower, really loud, right? And we put on the, the radio really loud because I said to myself, a guy that's paranoid has got to have the whole place bugged, and I don't want him to hear what we're about to say. And Tony's going, I can't take it anymore. It's been two days. I can't take five weeks here. I said, you don't understand. This is the movie. And he said, what are you saying? I said, this is the movie. Not what he's given us. That's bullshit. Whatever, whatever he did, he did. But this is the movie about two guys who would do anything for the money, who had to write a wise guy's thing and did this. And he looks at me. He goes, you're right. I said, look at us. We're in the bathroom with a shower and the faucet, and the faucet's running with a radio plane. This is the thing. <laughs> so what we did, we were, we were writing two scripts at the same time. We were writing his script and then we would write our script late at night. Because every time something happened, like the thing with Carmine, with the boot, like the thing with, uh, with uh, Bobby, with the, uh, you know, the spa, we would put all this in. And it was getting crazy. We were so excited to write the movie that his thing was like, because every time we would write something, he goes, no, that never happened. I know it happened. I know it says it in the FBI report because I read all the FBI reports. I wanted to do research on it, right? <laughs> never happened. What happened was I said to myself, this guy sounds like Robin Hood. This guy sounds like the greatest guy in the world. Why does he have 32 counts against him? It's impossible, right? He goes, well, let me just tell you something. We're going to go, uh, we got to go to strip clubs. I, I said, why, why do we have to go to strip clubs? I do my best thinking in strip clubs. <laughs> I said, okay. So now me, the Beast, Carmine, and Tony, we, we go to a strip club. We walk in, he's like the mayor. Everybody knows him. He's passing out hundreds. I'm saying to myself, what the hell, right? He goes, see these girls. He was really terrible to women. Uh, yeah, you know, he goes, don't worry about it. I give more hundreds that talk to us. I mean, it, it, and I just said, look, I'm not, I don't want any dances. Uh, you know, so I'm sitting next to him while he's getting a lap dance, folks. I got a pad and paper, and I'm writing. So I go, so, uh, so Bobby, when did this happen? I'll tell you, that and, he's, and he's getting a lap dance on the girl, and, I'm and he's talking to me. You can't make this shit up. I'm not making this up. I'm putting all this in the movie because I'm saying to myself, this is a classic movie. 
a classic. And he keeps talking about it. We keep writing. Every time something would happen, we would write another thing. All of a sudden, this guy was so good. Let me tell you how good this guy was. What a mouth he had. This guy, he was like that guy, you know that, you know that movie, uh, what's that movie where the guy goes, sell me this pen? Wolf of Wall Street. Wolf of Wall Street. I mean, he was better than him. This guy had a mouth. He was so good, he was actually turning my friend Tony to believe what he was saying. Tony goes, you know, I don't know. The guy sounds like he really got bamboozled, like the FBI really bamboozled. I said, Tony, you're listening to this shit? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, Chaz. This guy sounds like a man of steel. Like, I believe him. So now we actually put that in the, in the script that we're writing. <laughs> the two guys start fighting together because this was so insane. But it, I felt bad for Tony because you know why? I'm the one who dragged him down to Palm Beach. I'm the one who got involved, right? So we're, every time we would write something really good for him, you know, something edgy and really, no, take it out. I don't want my kids to see that. Take it out. That never happened. Big cigar. Champagne. Take it out. Take it out. Take it out. We're writing this movie. It looked like Sesame Street. It sucked. It wasn't good. And we knew it sucked, but we didn't care. Why? For the money. That's why. So we write this film. And uh, I got to be honest with you. It, uh, it wasn't good. And we knew it because he wouldn't allow us to put everything in it. But... The other script that we wrote now, we're excited about that one because we're writing about these two guys, these two guys that they did this. And at that time, we really wanted uh, somebody like Matthew Broadwick and, and Ben Stiller to play the part. And we wrote the script on spec. We didn't get paid for it. We just did it, you know? So we wrote the script and we gave, we turned in the script, his script. Meanwhile, we had our script. Oh, did I say? Yep. I'll bleep. I'm going to bleep this. We turned this thing into Bobby. Please. You, you know, okay. So we turned the script in. And the script went wild. It sold in 48 hours. That's how fast it sold. So we made the money on the script on the, that he paid us. And we made the money on this script that we wrote about this insanity that happened to us. So uh, the script, we were going to make the movie, and then the uh, typical story, uh, the president of the studio got canned, and it wanted to turn around, and now we have this great script called For the Money Out There that I hope we can make one day. I, every once in a while I get somebody who reads it, calls, my, calls me up, calls the manager, and says, who owns this script? And I told them how... But there's money against it, but it's such a great script. Now, were people after it because they knew the real story? No, no, no. This had nothing to do with the real story. We didn't. No, no. I mean, did people know that you went down there to write? No, st- nobody knew that we went down there. We just wrote the script, but it was just so beautiful because we didn't have to write anything. I mean, it was just we kept making stuff up, but we embellished what happened. But it, this was in. Same. And that guy never caught wind of the other script you wrote. No, he never caught wind of it. No. Well, it, it doesn't matter. It's not about him and his life. It's just, you know, <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that now. Yeah. I got to think about that. And no. you were never afraid of him finding out? Was this like a secret you two were keeping? Yeah. I mean, what could he say? You know, we, we wrote it. We were writing about other things, you know. But his script, that script, we never, he never sold it. It wasn't that good. Because it was like Sesame Street. I did this, and I, I donated this money, and I did this. And the, the, the incredible thing was that he was brilliant. I mean, he truly was brilliant. He was a brilliant guy. And I say that, not lightly. He was brilliant, man. He could sell you something and make you believe it like nobody else i ever seen. But... You know, he used it. He was a bad guy when it came to like, you know, well, he got involved and, uh, you know, he was a criminal. What could I say? But um, that's, those are the things sometimes that you do for the money. And I always say that when I, when I talk about for the money, things you do for the money in life, whenever you do something, remember this lesson, because I always like to give a life lesson. 
<laughs> Whenever you do something for money or for guilt, those two things, money or guilt, when you go against your gut and you do it for money or guilt, it will come back and bite you in the ass. It never works out. Never. You know, they say your gut, really it's not your gut, it's it's the big, it's the, your brain in the beginning. I think they call that the what, the cortex or something? So, I don't know. But they call Frontal that... cortex. Cortex, thank you, doctor. My son's so smart, college graduate. Uh, <laughs> it's right here where it actually, that's the part, your, your gut's going, eh. and I knew I shouldn't do this. I knew when I met him the first time I shouldn't do this. But I did it anyway. We both did it. But you know what? It worked out okay. We made some money. We got a good script. But boy, we ended up staying. We didn't stay the whole five weeks. I think we stayed like three weeks. But um, that was pretty crazy, man. And those are the things you do for the money, folks. And that's my life lesson to you. Don't do things for the money. Because in the end, it'll come back and bite you in the ass. That's today's episode about For the Money. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. Remember that in life. Don't do it. It ain't worth it. Guilt or the money. This is Chaz Palmateri Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe. And if you have any questions, because our neighborhood logic has been blowing up and taking off, if you have any questions for me, Chaz Palmateri Show at gmail.com. Write your questions in. I will answer them. I will say who you are. Say your name on the air if you want that. If you don't, no problem. But uh, we will see you next week. And remember, don't do it for the money. It's not worth it.